This is Guy Burgess. In the last post, I introduced you to a pretty formidable list of things that we would like to see done in the broad context of massively parallel peace building. In this post, what I want to focus on are the problems that might arise that might prevent us from actually doing those things. And if we fix those problems, what are the problems that might arise that prevent us from fixing the second order problems and the third order problems and fourth order problems and so forth. Or put another way, what this is is a post focused on the keys to making massively parallel peace building actually work. For example, we need to break the cynicism cap. We can't do any of this stuff as long as people persist in the notion that it's all hopeless and there's no alternative but destructive conflict as usual, and they might as well fight it out. Breaking the cynicism cap, that is giving people a sense that there really is a better way of doing things, is key to getting even the most rudimentary efforts to actually try to pursue that. Another big thing that we need to overcome is the free rider problem. Uh, the nature of the conflict problem, it's a we've met the enemy and he is us kind of problem, we're all part of it, uh, requires all of us to do our part to help solve it. And it's pretty tempting in our very busy world to say, well, I'm too busy to do that. I'll wait for Joe or Fred or whoever down the street to do my job as well as his job. So we need to somehow cultivate a sense that we can't be free riders on this. And if you're not part of the solution, you really are part of the problem. Another key to the success of all of this is we need to quit reinventing the wheel. And this happens far, far, far too often where people get involved in a difficult conflict problem and they try to make things better with the sort of immediate seat of the pants, instinct driven response without taking the time to find out what other people have learned and the sort of common mistakes that people make and building on those mistakes. So we need to quit trying to reinvent the wheel, go back, find out a good design for the wheel, and then try to advance that here, building a magnetic Levitron train, for example. Another key is we need to take advantage of low-hanging fruit. That is, there are some conflict problems that should be pretty easy to solve. There problems that are agreed upon by all sides and everybody has a sense, you know, this is really making things worse. At least you ought to be able to get agreement to fix that sort of thing. But at the same time, we also need to tackle the tough problems. And here I've always liked to invoke the story of the guy who was looking under a street light for something and a passerby came back and said, hey, can I help you? What, what you looking for? Oh, I dropped my keys. Well, where'd you drop them? In that dark alley down there. Well, why are you looking under the street light? Well, because the light's better here. Often we look for solutions to conflict problems where it's easy to look, and we avoid the dark, hard places where the real solutions lie. So while we should focus on the low-hanging fruit, we also need substantial numbers of people to focus on the tough problems. Yet another thing is focus on realistic ideas. And this is coming at the same theme from a couple of different directions, but it's an important idea. In the world of um, engineering and product development, it's important to have the design and the production engineers in the same room. So as you design a new product, this spiffy motorcycle, for example, um, you also think about what it would take to actually build it. And you don't come up with a design that you can't build and build it at an affordable rate. So when we think about designs for strategies for dealing with intractable conflict, we also have to think about, well, can we really build this and can we build it at an affordable rate? Can we train people to do it at an affordable Great. And if we can do that, then we stand a whole lot better chance of being successful. We also need to focus on the long term as well as the short term. People tend to become crisis oriented in conflict situations. And, oh, it's very, very sure we got to deal right now and you need to. 
but you also have to recognize that this problem is tough enough that it's going to require a long-term effort. And here I like to tell my students a story uh, first about the polio vaccine and how as a child I was, like all of my classmates, terrified of polio. And then one day there was a polio vaccine. And I still vividly remember getting a sugar cube with the polio vaccine in it. And that was the end of polio. And then I talk about Richard Nixon and he declared war on cancer in the early 1970s, thinking, well, we could do to cancer what we did to polio. And we're now four and a half decades into the war on cancer. And we're still a long, long way from a solution. But we have advanced basic science, applied science. We have treatments that are better. The prognosis, if you become a victim of cancer, is much better than it was 35 years ago. That's really what we're looking at with conflict, is it's going to take us decades to get a handle on this problem. But if we keep working on basic and applied research and developing newer and better conflict handling strategies, over time, we will get better and conflicts will get less destructive. Another key to making this all work is something we call a conflict learning curve accelerator. Uh, the truth is that the business as usual way we learn about conflict basically doesn't get us by the end of our natural working lifetime to the point where we've learned enough to get much past destructive conflict as usual practices. What we need is new paradigm learning, something that can move people a lot more quickly up the learning curve uh, than the way we're handling things now. And the truth is a lot of conflict topics are even taboo in schools these days. And, uh, we need to change that. People need to learn a lot of the ideas that we're trying to highlight in the context of this massively parallel peace building project. And in order to do that, uh, we need to focus on explaining ideas, not in jargon-filled academic gibberish that only a very few people can understand, but explaining ideas in ways that are engaging, that everybody can understand. It's something we've tried to do with this website, but we're nowhere near as good as it as we need to be. And over the longer term, it would be great to translate a lot of these ideas into more compelling um, set of learning materials. Another key, I think, to making massively peace, um, parallel peace building work is practical theory. Uh, Kurt Lewin has for years and years been widely quoted as saying there is nothing so practical as a good theory um, or widely adapted. And the truth is that conflict situations are so varied uh, that a cookbook approach that you do this, this, and this, and this just isn't going to work. But what will work is to help people understand broad general principles. And implicit in these 100 plus action steps uh, that are the core of massively parallel peace building, there is such a collection of general principles. And once you understand the principles, then you can adapt them to a wide range of circumstances. And I think that's a much more realistic way of trying to learn about the complex array of dynamics that underlie conflict problems. It's also important to work within circles of trust. Um, as you try to push people up the learning curve, it's important that the materials that different groups of people get are materials that they can understand and have confidence in. And that means they have to come out of their community of trust. Uh, they're not going to trust ideas that come from adversaries, pretty obviously. So the image I have in my head when I think about this is it's a lot like building bridges. And people that are trying to build a bridge to come together from different sides of the body of water um, do it in different ways because of their cultural and historical background and their 
approach to conflict, but they can still all meet in the middle. So here we have a number of different bridge designs as well as some different boats for places where your bridge doesn't quite do it yet. Uh, but there are lots of ways to build bridges and we need to encourage all of them and we need to find ways to tie these bridges together. Another big problem is sort of two-faceted. On the one hand, you have information friction. If it's too hard to find out how to build a wheel, the, the big ideas that have already been established and proven, then people are going to be forced to have to reinvent the wheel. And that will slow progress pretty dramatically. So we need some efficient way. And again, this website is a very crude attempt to try to address this problem of match, making it easier to match people up uh, with the ideas that they find most useful. And the truth is that one of the big criticisms of the website is we haven't yet quite figured out how to do that. And we need ideas, we need money to, to take this a bit further. But at the flip side of this is the drinking from a fire hose problem or information overload, uh, where if you flood people with too, in, too much information, that doesn't work either. And that's something that I'm afraid we're also a bit guilty of, but we try to find ways to avoid that. Um, and again, this is something that needs more attention. So this also illustrates how these second and third order problems are in many ways just as difficult as the first order problems. And it's just as important that we solve them. Um, it is also important that you harness learning institutions, because what we're trying to do is to get people to learn how to do this better. And there are lots of different ways in which society can spread information, uh, whether it's universities or training organizations, informal networks, popular self-help. One of the things that we like, and the reason we've devoted our career to trying to put things on the web, is it has a number of key features which other learning institutions have trouble uh, matching. One is that it's possible to provide an astonishing amount of material for free or next to free. Um, it can be, again, if you're clever in the design of your systems and we're not as clever as we'd like to be, customized to the needs of individual people. It can provide them with many lessons focused on what they care about um, on an anytime, anywhere, and now pretty much any media basis. So you can do things with web-based learning materials that you can't really do any other way. And so that's what we're trying to do, but there's a need to integrate what we're doing with more traditional learning institutions. Um, another key thing is that we need systems for updating conflict newcomers. Conflicts you can think of as this kind of blob and people get fired up and angry and they get involved in a conflict and then they get burnt out and they move on. And so you have people who come into a conflict not knowing much about it. By the time they leave, they've learned a great deal more um, but they take that knowledge with them. So you wind up repeating the same old mistakes again and again and again. What we need are systems that take the knowledge from people who are leaving a conflict arena and cycle it back around to people who are just starting to enter it. So hopefully they won't repeat the same mistakes and they'll take advantage of hard learned lessons. Another key point is that you've got to preach to more than the choir. And I think the field spends far too much of its energy uh, conducting workshops and programs and things that are for people who already agree with us and agree on 99% of what a system like uh, massively parallel peace building uh, might offer. Uh, we need to find ways to 
talk to and especially address the legitimate and often very legitimate concerns of skeptics. And that allows the whole body of knowledge to grow and be more sophisticated. And then finally, um, we need to persistently pursue opportunities. And one of the more dispiriting thoughts that one gets from working with all of this is right now the market share for constructive conflict interactions is way, way, way too small. In fact, I'm probably being generous in this little layer cake diagram. Um, and it seems like there's just no hope of getting enough people to change the way in which they behave in conflict situations enough to transform things from its current destructive state. Um, but Bill Urey years ago made a suggestion or observed the importance of developing plans to put on the shelf, contingency plans awaiting opportunities. And to a significant degree, what we're trying to do with massively parallel peace building is to lay out a set of ideas and to disseminate these as widely as possible um, to what will inevitably be a group of folks that are largely in agreement with us anyway. Um, and it may not be much more than that for a while, but sooner or later the destructiveness with which we now handle conflict will become widely apparent hopefully not through too tragic a series of events, but great tragedies are certainly possible. It's no accident that the United Nations came out of World War II, for example. Um, but when there's such a event, then people are likely to be interested in alternatives. And if the materials to outline in detail those alternatives are widely and readily available. It's quite possible that we could get a very quick change in the way people think about conflict. Uh, certainly the destructive conflict interactions that we're seeing now are getting sufficiently extreme that their legitimacy, I think, is teetering on collapse. And what we need to be ready for is when that happens. So that's the sort of hopeful thought of where this might go and what is admittedly a pretty depressing environment at the moment.